Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Jacob, and in this video, we are going to be talking about types. This video will be applicable to most programming languages. However, programming languages with type systems that are more functionally inspired or those with a more mathematical basis might be a little bit easier to use when trying to implement these concepts. We're going to be using Rust. As you probably know, the Rust compiler can spit out some pretty high quality error messages. For example, here it's recommending that we change the mutability of the variable x because a later line tries to mutate it. Here, it's suggesting a missing field's name from a types constructor. And here, it's suggesting we change an invalid identifier. The Rust compiler is really smart, and in conjunction with the language's powerful type system, you can have a really useful tool at your disposal. When you use types in your program, you're telling the compiler in what manner data can be represented. These types might be from the standard library, from a third-party library, primitives from the language, or even types that you wrote yourself. In Rust, these are like enums or structs, and in a language like Java, classes, and so on. These type declarations delineate the set of representable states in your application, and I'll be representing them as a blue circle in this video. Then there's your business logic. I'll be using a green circle to represent this. Business logic leverages those representable states, manipulates them around, and spits out some output. The data that your business logic can handle comprises the set of valid states. And critically, the set of valid states is not necessarily equal to the set of representable states. The difference between these two sets is the set of invalid states. The data which your program can take as input, but doesn't necessarily know how to handle properly. This is where bugs occur. In order to reduce bugs, we therefore need to minimize this gap. And to do that, we can either increase the number of cases handled by the code or decrease the number of representable states. Increasing the number of cases handled by the code tends to increase the code's complexity. And complex code also has a high tendency to be buggy if you're not careful. Therefore, in this video, we're covering the latter strategy, decreasing the number of representable states. Another way to think of this is that we're moving as many errors as possible from runtime to compile time. Let's take a look at a simple example. Here, we have a function that accepts a color as input. Right now, it takes a string. Let's see how this might pan out for our function. So we can give it this string, which is hash 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and that's black. Wonderful. It also accepts an RGBA string. Uh, in this case, it's a fully transparent. It can also accept this color name, purple, or sapphire, or five, which is not a color or that, which also is definitely not a color, or the empty string. And in general, uh, I mean, this means that the input to our function is probably that there's a wider set that our function can accept than our function probably would consider to be valid states. And this means that our function is going to have to contain some parsing logic and probably some error handling. If the function propagates the error, then by returning a result, or in like Java throwing an exception, then the calling code would need to do error handling as well. How can we improve on this? Well, Instead, let's introduce a simple data structure called color, which has two variants, one for RGB colors and one for RGBA colors. And we'll update our function to accept a parameter of this type. 
Let's take a look at the representable states now. Okay, so we can give it an RGB color and we can give it an RGBA color. Turns out all of the representable states are also valid states. This means that our sets are equal and no runtime error handling is necessary. Before I continue, let's take a step back and evaluate how we can benefit from coding like this. First, it helps to separate concerns within the code base. Before we can use user input in your business logic, it has to be validated and parsed into an internal data structure, like taking a string that might be input from a user and parsing it into a color uh, enum, color struct or something like that. And then, and only then, can it be used by our internal business logic. And then this requirement is enforced by the compiler because the parameter type of our business logic is this color struct and not a string. Then once we have the color struct or color enum, the guarantees which that parsing and validating step check for persist as long as the data exists. So as long as we're holding on to this color enum, this color value, we know it's a valid color. We're not holding on to a string, which maybe we checked a while ago, or maybe we don't know if we've checked this one. Have we checked this string? Is it a valid string? I don't know. You know maybe just check it again, right? But if you're holding on to a color value, you know it's a valid color as long as you're holding on to it. Then if we restrict the possible inputs to a function, for example, this means that the logic in the body of the function has to cover fewer cases. So generally, this will mean that if your types that your function accepts are more restricted, you're probably going to have to cover fewer edge cases because there just will be fewer edge cases. Then if your types mirror your business logic, changes to those types will cause compile time errors until your code is updated respectively. And this is a good thing. So we're going to encode as much of our business logic as possible into the types that we're using before we even start writing logic, right? And that means that when we actually do start writing our logic, our, our types are already going to be prepared for that logic. It's gonna be really easy to use them. And then if we change our types later, it'll force us to update our business logic accordingly. Finally, well-structured data types are easier to understand and to use. This is especially important in larger code bases with multiple contributors. Well-typed data is harder to mistakenly use incorrectly. Let's take a look at a little more complicated example. Imagine you're writing a Vim-like text editor. In Vim, you can perform different text editing actions. Uh, it's a modal text editor, and it has these different actions that it can do. We can move the cursor, uh, we can insert text, we can delete text, and these are like different motions, or maybe you're inserting some text at the current cursor location, so on and so forth. It's not super important to understand what these actually do in Vim. Um, but then Vim also has a concept of macros, and macros are a combination of actions that can be saved and executed at multiple times. In our example editor, we're going to add the constraint that recorded macros are not allowed to save or record macros inside of them. Note that real Vim actually does support recursive macro operations, but it this is a motivated example, so let's just roll with it. Um, if we were to implement a type for our actions, it might look something like this on first try. So we have here our uh, actions are represented by an enum. We have our move, our delete, our insert, and then we have our macro action, save macro and run macro. Our save macro accepts kind of this like configuration struct, which tells what register we're going to save the macro into. That basically just tells us which macro. So like macro A, macro B, and then 
when we run a macro, we say, I want to run macro A, I want to run macro B. Um, and so when we save a macro, we give it the location we want to save it, A, B, C, D, E, and the list of actions to save. Perfect. Uh, oh, also the motion and register structs are pretty irrelevant for this example. So they're just there to, <laughs> they, they don't do anything. So I didn't include the contents. Um, however, this doesn't actually preserve our extra constraint that we added. So this actions list here isn't supposed to be able to contain these two uh, macro actions, save macro and run macro. No big deal. We can still enforce this, no problem. We'll just make the fields of the save macro struct private and provide a constructor that enforces the constraint. Might look something like this. So we have an error type that has the two different errors that we might run into here. You're trying to save a macro when you can't save a macro within a macro, and you're trying to run a macro within a macro, which is also illegal. So then we have this constructor called new, it accepts the register and the list of actions. Then it goes through all of the actions, checks them, make sure none of them are macro actions. If one of them is a macro action, it returns the appropriate error. Otherwise it returns the okay ver uh, variant of result with a newly constructed save macro action inside of it. Okay, it's not too bad. We have a bit of code and a simple self-explanatory error type and our constructor works fine. So what's the issue? Well, whenever we want to use the constructor, the caller has to perform some error handling. Nah, it's not the end of the world. Uh, error handling is part of the job description. Here I've used unwrap, which will halt the program. It'll panic if it encounters any errors. So what happens if I uncomment this commented outline? Well, at compile time, actually nothing. But unfortunately, this code produces a runtime error. Our validation code only runs at runtime, so there's no way for the compiler to tell us anything has gone wrong. This is not actually necessarily a bad thing. Runtime errors are normal. Sometimes they're unavoidable. However, in this case, we can do better. Let's take another look at our type declarations and do a bit of restructuring to shrink the set of representable states and make it closer to the set of valid states. So let's rewrite our action and save macro types to look like this. You'll notice that I've extracted the macro legal actions out into their own enum, this edit, uh, edit action enum, so that's where the move, delete, and insert actions are now located. And the save macros actions field now takes a list of those edit actions. Uh, also notice that in this version, there's no constructor for save macro, uh, no, no like function constructor, and no type for constructor errors either. This is our complete set of types. Here's what it looks like to construct a save macro action that does the same thing as the example for the previous version did. However, this time, if I uncomment that commented out line here, we get an error at compile time. Perfect. This is exactly what we wanted. We defined our type system in a way that more closely mirrored our business logic. And in return, the Rust compiler was able to automatically validate more of our code at compile time. Compare this to the previous example where we had to write the validation code ourselves. And then, even then, we only got the error at runtime. Well, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something from it. My name is Jacob, and have a good one.